Well, good morning. Good morning. This morning we conclude our sermon series from the Gospel of John, titled That You May Be One. We began this series on September 10th and have continued this study in what has traditionally been called the Farewell Discourse of Jesus for the past 11 weeks. A lot has transpired in our congregation over those 11 weeks, and I am thankful to the Lord who has in his sovereignty seen fit to keep in front of us through his word teachings about the unity of his body as we have tra traversed these waters together. Over the past few months, we've considered the many ways in which we are united to Christ and to one another. We culminate today in the section of the discourse which is known as the High Priestly Prayer. We began studying that last week, where Jesus prays for his disciples and for us to be united as one through the gift of God the Father. So we conclude our study in chapter 17 of the Gospel of John, beginning in verse 20 through verse 26. I invite you to follow along in your Bible and as you are able to stand for the reading of God's Word. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given to me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and that Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, prays, prays for us and teaches us how to pray. Would your word sink down deep into our hearts? Would it change our minds? Would it change our very lives this day? We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> I had not been seated very long ere a man of a certain venerable robustness entered. Immediately, as the storm pelted door flew back upon bidding him, a quick regardful eyeing of him by all the congregation sufficiently attested that this fine old man was the chaplain. Yes, it was the famous Father Mapple, so called by the whalemen, among whom he was a very great favorite. He had been a sailor and a harpooner in his youth, but for many years past had dedicated his life to the ministry. At the time I now write of, Father Mapple was in the hardy winter of a healthy old age, that sort of old age which seems merging into a second flowering of youth, for among all the fissures of his wrinkles, there shone certain mild gleams of a newly developing bloom, the spring verdure peeping forth even beneath February snow. When he entered, I observed that he carried no umbrella, and certainly had not come in his carriage, for his hat ran down with melting sleet, and his great pilot cloth jacket seemed almost to drag him to the floor with the weight of the water it had absorbed. However, hat and coat and overshoes were one by one removed and hung up in a little space in an adjacent corner. When arrayed in a decent suit, he quietly approached the pulpit. Like most old-fashioned pulpits, it was a very lofty one, and since a regular stair was too much height, the long angle with the floor would seriously contract the already small area of the chapel. So the architect, it seemed, had acted upon the hint of Father Mapple and finished the pulpit without stairs, substituting a perpendicular side ladder like those used in mounting a ship from a boat at sea. 
halting for an instant at the foot of the ladder and with both hands grasping the ornamental knobs of the ropes, Father Mapple cast a look upwards and then with a truly sailor-like but still reverential dexterity, hand over hand, mounted the steps as if ascending the main top of his vessel. I was not prepared to see Father Mapple, after gaining the height, slowly turn around and stooping over the pulpit, deliberately drag up the ladder step by step till the hole was deposited within, leaving him impregnable in his little Quebec. I pondered some time without fully comprehending the reason for this. Father Mapple enjoyed such a wide reputation for sincerity and sanctity that I could not suspect him of courting notoriety by any mere tricks of the stage. No, thought I, there must be some sober reason for this thing. Furthermore, it must symbolize something unseen. Can it be, then, that by that act of physical isolation he signals his spiritual withdrawal for the time from all outward worldly ties and connections? Yes, for replenished with the meat and wine of the word to the faithful man of God, this pulpit, I see, is a self-containing stronghold. Nor was the pulpit itself without a trace of the same sea taste that had achieved the latter. Its paneled front was in the likeness of a ship's bluff bows, and the Holy Bible rested on a projecting piece of scroll work fashioned after a ship's fiddle-headed beak. What could be more full of meaning? For the pulpit is ever this earth's foremost part. All the rest comes in its rear. The pulpit leads the world. From thence it is the storm of God's quick wrath is first descried, and the bow must bear the earliest brunt. From thence it is the god of breezes fair or foul is first invoked for favorable winds. Yes, the world's a ship on its passage out, and not a voyage complete, and the pulpit is its prow. This is an excerpt from Herman Melville's Moby Dick, if you hadn't captured that already. And the world, Melville says, is a ship with a pulpit at its foremost part. The pulpit leads the world is a bold claim, especially standing in one. But I wish to amend it only slightly to say the church leads the world. And it may initially sound absurd, uh, but it is not to say that the church does or literally should run civil governments. The church doesn't lead the world in that way. But the way the church goes, so goes the world. As the church is stable and strong in her moral and spiritual teaching in life, the world will follow that, whether it realizes it or not. And as the church is unsure and unsteady, confused, divided, or sporadic, she will lead the world, whether she knows it or not, in the same direction. We cannot control the waves, nor the wind, nor the sea, but for better or for worse, the church is at the head of the ship, and the witness of the church, the witness that she bears, either steers the world towards Christ or towards crisis. Our immediate context for our passage in John 17 this morning is the few verses preceding verse 20 that we began at. Jesus prays for the disciples to be sanctified, which means to be set apart, to be made holy. Jesus says, Father, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. He's saying, the Lord sanctified me for this purpose, and now I'm in turn sanctifying you for this purpose. The Lord sent me, I am sending you. So this is our context for our passage. Jesus is not of the world, but he is sent into the world, that the world might be saved through him. Likewise, his disciples are not of the world, but he sends his disciples into the world to bear witness to him in the world. So as we pick up in verse 20, Jesus continues his prayer, and he says, I do not ask for these only, that's the disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. And this is an astonishing reality. He says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in the future, in me through their word. Jesus prays for us. Jesus prays for you. The incarnate word, the son of God, the son of man, 2,000 years ago, in flesh and blood, 
bound in the timeline of the first century in the ancient Near East, prays for you. He prays for us. Jesus, whose name is Emmanuel, which means God with us, he did not come near in an abstract way. He was not with us only in an abstraction. He prays for us. As Christians, we are connected to the saints of all the ages, those who have come before, those who will come after, those in our midst right now. And if you trust in God's word, as it comes to us in Scripture, by the inspiration of the Spirit, through the human vessels like John, that we are reading out of the Gospel of now, then Jesus prays for you. You are not a random accident. You are not a series of chance happenings or the whims of an impersonal universe. The God of the cosmos who created all things created you with purpose. And if you're here this morning, it is in his providential care. He wants you to know that Jesus prays for all who believe. But what exactly does Jesus pray for? What does he pray for for us? Verse 21 says that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Christ prays for unity and and for witness. It's a simple reality, but it's quite profound, just like Jesus praying for us. It's, It's a simple idea, but it is a profound impact on our hearts. So Christ praying 2,000 years ago that still rings true today for us through the ages is that all those who believe in him would enjoy the same kind of unity with each other that he has with the Father. That is a profound unity. Orthodox Christianity describes this unity as one true eternal God, the same in substance, equal in power and glory. It's not metaphorical. It's literally the same in substance. And that kind of unity, he's saying, this should be ours in Christ. It's kind of a paradox, this indwelling. The Father is in the Son, and the Son is in the Father, mutually indwelling one another, and we are meant to be in them somehow. I don't know how you make that three-dimensionally work. And we are meant to be one with another. That's the kind of oneness that Jesus is praying for. And all of that to the end that we would bear witness to the world, that the world would believe. The same purpose that Christ gave to the apostles in the first century, earlier in the prayer, he's saying explicitly he gives to us, that our unity would bear witness to him. Because the church is meant to lead the world to Christ. And if it doesn't, we lead the world towards crisis. How does this happen, though? What does Jesus say, the witness to the watching world? How does, this, how does this work? He says the union is twofold. The union is with Christ, with the Father, with the Trinity, and it's also with one another. And we need both of those unions, both the unity vertically and horizontally to bear witness to the world. I think it's like observing a family. You've probably seen other families that aren't your own interacting with one another. And you might be able to put on a show for the outside world for a short period of time, but with prolonged exposure, you can't really fake it as a family. At least I can't fake it as a family. (laughs) Whatever relationships exist between the members of the family, those eventually manifest themselves in obvious and observable external ways. The way the mom and dad talk to each other. Is it warm? Is it cheerful? Is it harsh? How about the way the parents talk to the kids? Is it patient? Is it clear? Is it loving? Is it annoyed? How about how the children respond to the parents? Are they quick to listen? Are they obedient? Are they defiant or sneaky? How about how the kids talk to one another? Do they cooperate? Are they happy? Or is there bickering or name calling? Is there a general sense of joy and hospitality and happiness in the family? At some point, and it'll, I would guess, and venture to say, it's probably sooner than you care to admit, you develop a gut instinct about people and about a family that you're observing. You either intuit, I think I want to be around them more. I I like this. This makes me feel good. Or I don't really want to be around this anymore. I'm not even sure why. I'd rather just go somewhere else. Well, this is the way that it is with the family of God. This is the way that it is with the church. The world is watching. And the world gets a sense of what's going on by being around us, and we can't fake it. 
the relationships that exist here in the family of God spill out all over the place into our witness to the watching world. Because our relationships are our witness to the world. The way we treat one another in the church, the way we speak about one another, either to each other's faces or not, the way we pray for one another is all manifestly obvious, even if we don't think that it is. We might think that we're, we're working, uh, working around it, but people have gut instincts that are much more developed than our cognitive thoughts about the things we are witnessing. And so our witness to the world either leads people to think, yeah, I want to be around these people. I want to be in the church. Or I'm not so sure. I'd rather get away from that. So what are our relationships like? What are our relationships in the church like? How do we treat one another? How do we live into this witness to the watching world? As James says, are we quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, being doers of the word and not hearers only? He continues to go on and say, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. At the risk of stating something quite obvious, the Bible says that in order to be Christians, we should act like Christians. If we're going to be Christians, we should learn to think, we should learn to behave like Christians. This first happens on the personal level, me and Jesus. My heart has to be made right in him. But then we realize that we are persons connected to persons in the Trinity who must be connected to persons in the church. That kind of unity, vertical and horizontal. And that's both here at this church, Beverly Heights, but also every church, every believer, the invisible church, as the Reformed tradition calls it, in all times, in all places. And of course, it's important to recognize we actually can't do that. We can't do that on our own. This is a work of God. We are not enough to accomplish this. Our orthodoxy is good. We should believe rightly. But orthodoxy alone is not enough. It's not enough for us to believe correct ideas about Jesus. James says, you believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Our church attendance is good. We should gather together. But church attendance on its own is not enough. Our witness to the world cannot be reduced to a checklist of works can't be just an itemized list of things. We don't show the world the love of God simply by showing up to the same building every time each week. If we are not showing up on the Lord's day eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, then our attendance is not a good witness. Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind, in the same judgment, but unity is hard work. And even though it's not a work that we can accomplish on our own, we have a lot of effort to put into it. So how do we do this? What happens in the mixture of the work of God in us and our faithful obedience to him in the world? <clears throat> Jesus goes on in verse 22 and 23. He says, The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Jesus expounds in his prayer, saying, The glory of God given to him has been given to us. And this is not a one time uh, effect that wears off. This glory is not to be temporarily one or conceptually one, it's to be perfectly one. The word perfect means brought to completion or finished. Unification is at once a work of God and simultaneously a process 
being brought to completion so that the world may know that the Father sent the Son and loves his children. I find the language of oneness and knowledge very interesting. It shows up at key points in Scripture. The first place is in the very beginning, in Genesis chapter 2. At the end of Genesis 2, we read that, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This kind of oneness is not symbolic. It's real. It's flesh. It's blood. The union that is fruitful and the union that is spoken about in Scripture only a few chapters later as knowledge. Genesis 4.1 says, Now Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. The one flesh union of Adam and Eve produces offspring. Adam knew Eve, and a baby is born. This is not the kind of knowledge you gain from textbooks. Babies are not magically begotten through learning information in our brains. This is the kind of knowledge we're talking about as intimate and fruitful. The world will see and believe in Christ when it sees his glory manifest, fruitful in his church. They will see the fruit of oneness and believe on account of it. It's a profound statement that Christ repeats in Matthew. He says, so they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. When God unites something, it is truly united. We should not try to separate it. So here's the thing that I think we often don't recognize about Christ's prayer and what this means. If God has united something in Christ, then it actually is already united. We are already united in Christ. This is not a work we have to accomplish. This is not an outcome we have to achieve by our own effort. We are not enough, again. It's a reality that is already accomplished on our behalf, and we have to live like it's true. Jesus doesn't pray in hopes that one day this will come to pass. He says, this is why I gave you my glory. You are one. Be one. To be perfected in unity, in your witness to the watching world. When I got married to Sarah, I didn't have to keep working on becoming married to her every single day. We were married in that moment. We were united by God. But the rest of our married life together, and we still are working into it, we are working on being sanctified and perfected in our marriage. It is at once true in time, at a point in time, and at once a process of becoming perfected in Christ communicating, refining, constantly coming to know each other at a deeper, more intimate level, seeking to be faithful and fruitful in the word. So there is no confusion about the two states that simultaneously are true. Sarah and I are united, and we are in the process of being perfected. In the same way, what God has joined together in his son, the church, is not something that we have to continually accomplish. It is already done but it does take the obedient and faithful work of being perfected in Christ by the Spirit to be sanctified and grow into maturity. Jesus continues in verse 24, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Jesus knows that when we see his glory, we will see the Father's love. And the word for see here is an interesting one. It's not the normal word for I see this with my eyes. The first time it shows up in the New Testament is Matthew 27 at Christ's crucifixion when it says there were many women there looking on from a distance, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. The next time it's used is a few verses later when Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. In John's gospel, he says, whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. The idea that is being conveyed here is that sight moves beyond the physical into the perceptive. Christ prays for his disciples to not just walk by faith, but to be given spiritual sight. He concludes in in the following verses and concludes our passage this morning. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you. And these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known, that the love with which you loved me 
may be in them and I in them. The world does not know God, but we do. We know the Father through the Son. He has revealed the Father to us, and his love is in us because Christ is in us. This is why, for better or for worse, the church leads the way for the world. Our witness, our life as a family of believers, our reverence for the Lord, our union with him, our unity with one another, bears witness to all who are watching. The church either leads the world towards Christ or crisis. So the question becomes, where are we leading? Perhaps to make that question a little bit more concrete, the question I think is, where are our eyes fixed? Where are your eyes fixed? What is it that we are focusing on when the waves billow around us? Because where we fix our eyes is inevitably where the body will go. At the beginning of John 17, the beginning of our passage from last week, what we are concluding today, we read, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven. Christ fixes his gaze upon the Father and says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Jesus turns his eyes to the one he is praying to, And he prays that we might see his glory, that the world might see and know his love. There's no way of getting through this sermon series without seriously considering the state of our church and the state of our own hearts. Melville describes the pulpit as the prow of the world's ship. It is pointing the direction the whole world is heading. Excuse me. Melville describes the pulpit as the prow of the world's ship. So where is the church fixed? Where are we fixed? Where are our eyes fixed? There are a thousand things that can distract us from looking to Christ. Even when Jesus is right in front of us, calling us by name, how often are we like Peter when the wind and the waves distract us. They grow too strong. We take our eyes off of him and we sink beneath the waves. Where are we taking our eyes off of Christ? As we come to a close this morning, I thought I would give a few summary thoughts on signs, signs that our eyes can see, our spiritual eyes can see, signs that our eyes are either fixed on crisis or signs that our eyes are fixed on Christ. If our heart has a root of bitterness in it, if we are consumed with anger or wrath towards our enemies, if we become obsessed with wrongs done to us and in our lives, if our lives are marked by clamor, we do not have our eyes fixed on Christ. Bitterness is like a poison that slowly eats away at our soul. It turns our hearts to stone. It turns our wine to vinegar. It makes the whole environment toxic around us. And if this is you, you don't have to live like that. You can lay it down at the foot of the cross. Fix your eyes on Christ and experience freedom from a heart of bitterness. Perhaps the most single obvious sign that our eyes are fixed on Christ is when our hearts and our lives are marked by joy. A joy that cannot be shaken by external circumstances. No matter how rough the storm upon the sea gets, The joy keeps the prow of the ship pointed at true north, heading in the right direction, focused on Christ. There is surety, there is confidence, and it surpasses the circumstances around us. And it's not like this just magically happens. The Bible says that gratitude, thankfulness, is a practice that we build up in our lives. Psalm 100 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. When our eyes are fixed on Christ, Our hearts learn to be thankful, and that thankfulness produces joy. Here's another important one. Are our lives marked by anxiety or by peace? Which one rules our hearts more? Jesus says that, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or drink, or nor about your body, what you will put on. 
Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? The birds are fed, the lilies are clothed, and you are infinitely more valuable than them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. When our days are marked more by anxiety than they are by peace, it is likely a sign that we do not have our eyes fixed on Jesus. There's a kind of anxiety that is clinical. I don't want to dismiss that. But there is a more fundamental anxiety that comes simply from not knowing and not trusting the Lord. Working with young adults today gives me a front row seat to the damage that is done, I think particularly to young women, by categorizing anxiety as exclusively or primarily a mental health issue. The problem is when we do this, we ignore the promises of God as known in Christ as they relate to anxiety. We should be asking, do I seek first his kingdom? Or is his kingdom just one priority among many in my life? Work, family, school, friends, grades, career. How do I balance all of those? The answer is we can't. If we're trying to, that's a recipe for anxiety, not a solution to it. So before we jump to the mental health category, we must confess as Christians and believe as Christians that Jesus is who he says he is, and we can trust him. I'm not saying don't get help if you need help. Don't hear me say that. But I am saying we all need Jesus. Actually, Jesus is saying we all need Jesus. And if we try to treat spiritual anxiety as if it's clinical, we will only get worse over time. So begin by fixing your eyes on him. Philippians says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. You know the next part. And the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Peace is the antithesis to anxiety. And it comes to us as a gift from God when we put our trust in him and let go. Next, if when our eyes are fixed on crisis, we tend to corrupt things. It's a biblical category. Our very speech can give others permission to complain or to gripe. We tend to multiply grievances. One common form of corruption in our world today is when we get caught in a cycle of sexual sin, whether it be lustful thoughts or pornography, a sexual relationship outside of marriage, or perhaps what seems like merely just a heartfelt conversation with a coworker of the opposite sex that makes us feel good, especially among men. This kind of corruption is like a fever. As long as it's going on, we can still kind of sort of function, but not anywhere close to our God-given capacity. And when we live our lives like this, with sin tucked away in a corner somewhere of our life, we are living with a spiritual fever, handicapped from witnessing to our families and to the world as we should. We have to take our eyes off of the fleshly desires and train them back on Christ. And it is a training. You have to be retrained. If we want to be free from sexual sin, but also free to live in Christ, our eyes matter. But when we fix our eyes on Jesus, you will find that honesty, not corruption, tends to surround you. Truth has a tendency to migrate in your direction. Falsehoods and conspiracies begin to be easily spotted, and we don't give them a second chance or quarter in our mind. Likewise, the more our eyes are fixed on Christ, the more we desire for honest labor, We will do our work diligently. We won't try to cut corners. We won't try to be spiteful. We won't try to be lazy. We'll be faithful with our words and our station in life. If sexual sin marks a natural corruption when our eyes are taken off Christ, then fidelity to Christ, to our marriages, to our families, is what marks a person whose eyes are fixed on Christ. We will find ourselves more content, more satisfied with what previously was a source of corruption or complaint. Lastly, one sign that we don't have our eyes fixed on Christ is that we experience isolation from other believers. We tend to focus all our attention on the deceitful schemes of men rather than on Christ. This not only robs us of peace and joy, but we become obsessed with wrongs and transgressions done to us rather than allowing ourselves to be healed. When we keep ourselves from forgiving others or from accepting forgiveness, we end up marooned on an island, isolated and alone. But when we fix our eyes on Christ, we learn patience. 
It's a fruit of the Spirit. We also learn that as we deal patiently with others in our church or in our family or in our neighborhoods, we end up caring more about being united to one another than about being right in an argument. We'll end up first pointing the finger at ourselves, looking to remove the log from our own eye. And our talk should be the kind that is used for building up, as fits the occasion that may give grace to those who hear. When we have our eyes fixed on Christ, we begin to find that when we speak, others are drawn to us for the purpose of being filled and strengthened in Christ. People who used to come around, and you know these people, maybe you're one of them, they were merely looking for sympathy in their grievances. I just want to talk. I just want to, I just want to, I just want to talk a little bit. Those people will eventually stop coming around because you won't supply them with the sympathy in their grievances. But others who are looking for true encouragement that comes from godly wisdom, that comes from God's word, they will start to show up more often. I'm sure there's a lot of other parallels we could draw. These were just four that came to my mind. But I think you get the point. It's kind of like the gut feeling you have when you see that family interact. Your instincts on this are probably far more honed than your cognitive thinking about it. You know where you are on the spectrum. So where are your eyes fixed? What fills your vision? And what in turn fills your heart? Where is the prow of your ship heading? And where are we as the church leading the world? Fix your eyes on Christ. Look to him. Look to Jesus. Trust him. Accept the union with him that he tells us about. He will not lead us or leave us. He will not lead us astray and he will not leave us to ourselves. As we look to him, as we trust him, he will lead us. He will lead his church and the world will know and believe in him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks that you pray for us. Christ It's amazing to think that even 2,000 years ago, your word, as it was incarnate, was already doing the work in our hearts 2,000 years later. Lord, we pray that you would give us the sight to see, the courage to keep our eyes fixed on you, to keep the prow of our life, but also collectively as united to one another and united in you, the prow of the ship, of the church, and of the world pointed to Christ. Help us to be faithful. Help us to submit and be joyful in all that you've given us to do, that we would bear witness not just to the world, but to one another, that we would find joy in our relationships with you and with other believers. We pray this thankfully in Jesus' name. Amen.